So welcome. Uh, my name is Peter Andre. I'm the director of the Carleton Center for Community Innovation. Thank you all for being here today. It was great to hear those introductions. Um, on the Carleton Center for Community Innovation, let me tell you a bit about us. Acting as a catalyst and convener and linking research to practice and policy, 3CI seeks to serve local and national nonprofit, voluntary and philanthropic sectors, as well as indigenous institutions and governments. We aim to enhance understanding and knowledge of the distinct contributions of these bodies to community vitality in Canada and beyond. 3CI is based at Carleton University, <clears throat> located on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. The Centre is committed to collaborative and Indigenous-led research. So today's webinar is the third in our series of roundtables on community-based research, and it's a little bit different today. We're focusing on careers in community innovation, and we've brought back three people who all worked at various points in time as researchers, as students, as, as, and as student research assistants and or, and or collaborators on uh, research projects hosted by 3CI. Um, Omar El Sharkawi is a program manager, a focal point for equitable access to healthy and sustainable food at Food Secure Canada. Uh, and Food Secure Canada is a national uh, civil society organization in Canada that advocates for healthy and sustainable food systems and just food systems. Uh, Heather, Heather Shigian uh, is assistant professor at Royal Roads University School of Business. She teaches in the Masters of Global Management program the BBA in Innovation and Sustainability, and a Graduate Certificate Program in Corporate Social Innovation. And finally, uh, Karim Harji works with investors and ventures to describe, measure, and improve their social impact. He's the Program Director of the Oxford Impact Measurement Program at the Said Business School, University of Oxford, and Managing Director of Evalysis, an impact measurement and management consultancy. Um, those are just some quick intros on all three of our panels, be, panelists, because each of them, I think, will tell you a little bit more about what they do now. And what I've asked them to do is think about their journey since Carlton. You know, how did where they get where they are now and the kind of work they're doing now in this space of community innovation relate to what they learned or did at Carlton, or maybe it didn't very well, and they can tell us a bit about what we're not doing properly here at the university end of things. Um, and, uh, and along the way, I've also invited them, if they want to venture into this, to even define what do, what do we mean by community innovation? What's happening in this space? And, and what do they see as possibilities in terms of careers and possibilities for those who are currently graduate students, as most of our audience is here today? So with that as our introduction, I'll pass it first over to Omar to share some opening remarks for the next five minutes or so. Thanks, Peter. And hi, everyone. Um... Maybe I, I first I'll, I'll talk about the community innovation to maybe can contextualize just um, this my story and or a small part of it and I'll try to keep it short so we can leave more room for discussion as we're, we have a good number of people here. So I think for me community innovation um, well the word innovation in and of itself uh, when I was about 17 18 when I first started uh, university I, I really associated it only with um, Silicon Valley and sort of all the um, and mostly I, I studied environmental studies so I mostly looked at the externalities and maybe the bad parts of, of Silicon Valley so I was always really turned off by that term um, and then so when I joined uh, 3CI as a, as a research assistant in my this summer of my second year at Carleton I really started to think about um, what 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 how we can sort of as civil society can take back the the meaning of innovation and what that actually what that actually looks like. So um, uh, there's just more of three side pointed me in the right direction for me to sort of uh, take my own understanding of that. And that's one thing I liked about three CIs the really diverse group diverse projects a uh, number of projects that are going on. We have I mean, I, I can see now there's some, some things about indigenous governance, but also some things about responsible investing. Not that those two don't intersect, but um, I really like that community innovation is broad and means different things for different people. So what that looks like to me was about things just like how 
overall how communities work together to uh, for for the public good um, and to take control of things like just basic human rights like housing um, through things like uh, community land trusts um, and this this is the sort of thing that I really consider to be innovative and that's what I continue to do to this day so um, like I said I joined uh, 3CI in my, in my second year and I was I actually there until uh, my last day at Carlton when I graduated. Um, so it was really a big part of my undergraduate experience. And at 3CI, I got to work with a number of different uh, nonprofits and community organizations um, that really expanded my, just my worldview. Uh, we worked a lot with uh, housing organizations, uh, food organizations, including my current employer, Food Secure Canada. Um, what else? There was just a lot, a lot of organizations that we worked with and Obviously, in the beginning, I was just um, an observer. I tried to listen a lot more than talk, uh, at least in my first two years. Um, and that really helped expand both my network and then also later on translated into things like building my resume. Um, so I was really lucky in my program that we had options to do um, placements uh, with community organizations. And I relied on a lot of those networks that I developed during my time with 3CI. Um, so I had a, I, sort of three placement experiences, so half term or uh, semester long courses where I would go to an organization about once a week. Um, and that was, that was really good. It really helped build my resume uh, in, a, in, like in a healthy place, should I say, by the time I graduated. Um, so I took every opportunity I could with these courses, but also even with my undergraduate thesis, which could have been a very theoretical exercise. Um, I worked with Peter, who was my supervisor at the time, to push me to, um, to work with um, community champions on things like how do, they, how do we get together to push changes in certain programs. So we worked with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture to try to influence some of their work to work better for community organizations. Um, so I'll conclude by saying like this like, piece of advice that Peter asked me to share was that um, at the time when I was reaching out to organizations to try to work there, um, during my time at 3CI, I always saw and heard that nonprofits and organizations are overworked, don't have time necessarily to um, do some hands-on supervision of people, but at the same time, they're, they're, they lacked a lot of capacity. So it was that really, you need to be really careful with how you mix those two. Um, so I would approach organizations with a very, like I would sort of come up with a plan before even approaching them and say, this is what I can do. This is where I can help. Does that work for you and me or no? So at the same time, you have to be flexible um, and understand that I was, I was just a student in my third or fourth year. And uh, no matter how, whatever I can contribute is, is not gonna change the world. So doing that, but also setting boundaries expectations beforehand um, and learning to be independent. Um, and all of those things obviously have had some more successful placements and, and, and whatnot than others. But overall, I think with those guiding principles, um, I had a good start to my career, which I can talk to you about later and I'll conclude here. Thanks so much, Omar. Uh, really fascinating. And I really like, uh, you know, when you're thinking back to yourself, you were an undergraduate student doing some of this work as an RA, um, you know, the balance between really wanting to listen, pay attention, figure out what's going on among the partners that we're working with in academia. And then, uh, you know, th there's a balance between that and what you're saying about being clear about what you could do, what you can offer, I recognize you're overworked, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but here's maybe some value added that I can offer. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I remember now why we hired you already as a second year undergrad, because you, you, we, we saw the potential for that. So I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, Heather. Heather, welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks, Peter, and really appreciate the invitation. Um, so I was a research assistant at the Carleton Center for Community Innovation back in between 2008 and 2010. And I worked on the Responsible Investment Initiative with Tessa Hebb, who was the, the former director of the center. Um, so I did everything from research interviews, literature reviews, um, co-authoring academic papers. So as a, a graduate student, it was a really exciting opportunity to, to have that. Um, had that as an option uh, 
presenting at, at academic conferences and then also organizing conferences while I was an RA. Um, I think it was the probably the second uh, Principles for Responsible Investment conference that we hosted in Ottawa. So I got an opportunity to, to help with organizing uh, that conference as well as um, one of the answer, uh, the social economy research uh, conferences where we, we ended up doing a, a bus tour of of social enterprises in the, the Ottawa Gatineau region. Um, and I, I have a really fond <laughs> memory of, of that bus tour during my, my time at 3CI, um, because I think it, it really sort of exemplified that that sort of emphasis on getting out into communities or like and and really like getting out of the the sort of the you know the dungeon tower at I think where we were at the time and um, and you know, getting getting away from your desk and, and really getting that sort of opportunity to, to sort of um, be engaged and, and sort of be out there in community in a very sort of physical sense. Um, and, yeah, so I remember we had this big yellow school bus sort of driving around all these different food-based social enterprises and we were taking conference participants to, uh, to visit those. Um, and I think that just, yeah, that just really, sort of like that whole range of, of activities from, you know, like the very sort of, traditional academic work around like research interviews and lit reviews to that sort of more um, community, very sort of community oriented um, work was just such a great exposure to, to a range of different um, people and, and networks and, and skills that I continue to use on a, a daily basis, like now in, in my, um, my academic career. Um, so I would say just reflecting back on, on my time at 3CI as an RA, it was, it was really a, a profound inflection point for me. I think, it, it, you know, that point where I really began to build networks um, that I'm still very much engaged with today. Um, you know, people who I, I met at, at uh, 3CI who I, I work with regularly. Um, I think also those sort of co-authoring opportunities as a a master's student that, that really served me well on the, the academic career track. Um, but I think more than, than equipping with me with those sort of very technical skills and the, the networks and social connections, I think my, my time at 3CI really helped me to understand the, the type of academic I wanted to be and, and also the type of academic I didn't want to be and, and where I wanted to really place emphasis on the, the type of research that I engage with and, and the purpose of that research. Um, so I, I think there's there's so much you know, work to be be done, not only sort of during, um, but also sort of after that, you know, that traditional sort of academic um, paper publication um, roots, where where it's you know that 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 process to translate some of the knowledge and mobilize that knowledge, um, to actually make it relevant and useful for communities and people. Um, takes a lot of, of sort of additional sort of energy and, and attention and focus that I think that, um, you know, in, in sort of traditional academic um, careers, you, you, you're you not really encouraged or sort of given that space to, to focus on. But, but I think that that is really the, the good fight in, in, in uh, academia. I think the, the, you know, the pressures that, that sort of draw you away from spending time on, on on doing that type of, of knowledge translation and, and engagement with community. Um, I think especially if you're in the earlier days of your career, some of those systemic challenges like around the tenure process and just the structure of some of the, the grants um, and how they're sort of evaluated and, and distributed based on, on sort of more traditional academic metrics. Um, so I see a lot of challenges in, in, in that respect in terms of doing more of the sort of community innovation um, type of research, but but at the same time, I continue to be inspired by by those who have sort of led the way through that um, through those challenges. You know, I think many of those those people are at 3CI, like like Tessa and, and like Kate uh, Ruff and and Peter and uh, Ted Jackson. So so I think you know, in terms of advice, I'd say like uh, um, look to those who have sort of gone through the, through this um, journey and and. Um, I think take take lessons from from those experiences, and and for those of you who are working as RAs right now at um, at Carleton, I know it's a busy time, but but certainly find ways to leverage your your uh, your RA work with with some of your coursework. Um, you know, if you're working on a thesis or a major project, find ways to sort of um, bridge that with, with some of your RA work. Um, go to all those academic conferences. Take 
your supervisor up on those opportunities to, to co-author or co-present at a conference, because even if you're not pursuing an academic career, those types of, of experiences will really serve you well going forward. Um, start building your network now. I, I didn't know at the time, but but I, as I said, I, I regularly interact with, with people that I met at 3CI like 10, 12 years ago. And, and you know, these people have become quite a significant part of my, my professional life. And, and you know, I really see these as, as lifelong connections. Um, and then third, don't be afraid to, to try different roles after graduating. Um, trying something and finding it doesn't work or it's not a, a good fit or alignment, um, that's not a, a bad thing um, necessarily. I think you you can take that knowledge and that experience and understanding of that, that, that you know, culture with you. And, and, and I think that's what community innovation requires is really that understanding of, of how these different partners of the government sort of you know that experience working in civil society as a civil servant um as well as working in the private sector and sort of understanding um as well the the sort of more traditional academic um research and, and culture um sort of having sort of an understanding of how all those three um sort of sectors work together and some of the constraints and and pressures that that they face um i think can, can really serve you well so i know in my journey i took sort of a i guess what what to me be considered a longer route um than than maybe most in terms of like getting into a into a very um into an academic career but but i don't look at that as sort of a waste of, of time and some of the other um, things I did along that journey to to get to where I am, and and I think a lot of yeah, sort of that knowledge and that that sort of understanding of of those different sort of cultures, um, really I think serves me me well today as an academic. So so I see I'm kind of at my my five minute work mark, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it there and save some of my my other comments for the discussion. Thanks so much, uh, Heather. I um, you know what I'm hearing because you have or you're now in an academic job. Um, but it seems like, uh, and you say you're being up, held to traditional academic uh, metrics uh, in terms of expectations around publishing and so on. Um, but it seems that you've also really been able to build a career just looking at some of the names, uh, some of the type of work that you're doing these days that still pays a lot of attention to the community sector and to thinking about innovation very broadly. So I I'm looking forward to hearing more from you on that in the Q&A, but I'll pass it on first to uh, Karim Harji. Welcome, Karim. Thanks, Peter. Um, hello, everyone. So, I mean, Omar and, and Heather, it was great to hear you both describe your journey and I'll try and build on some of that. Um, so I've probably got the longest maybe <laughs> uh, association probably since 2006, I guess, with you, Jen, uh, when, when things were you know, at that transition point. And um, so Ted Jackson, who some of you may know, um, was really the person who spearheaded the first part of uh, my interaction with, with 3CI and then um, subsequently Tessa Hebb. Um, and interestingly, I still work with both. Um, so for me, you know, my, my running joke um, has been with Jen also is that I never really left <laughs> 3CI. Um, so for those of you that are RAs, just uh, just be careful. This might last you at least a decade and a half or so, which is what it seems like it has for me. Um, but I would say kind of looking back and, and I, I went to a couple of the milestones and it was fascinating because um, this is really a classic example when at the time, I just thought it was a really good, fun, generative um, experience. Looking back on it, I could see how helpful and even transformative it was uh, for my career and and as both Omar and, and Heather have explained, like, you know, the person you want to be and how you want to contribute. Um, and, and I think it's, it's partly that kind of structure that's somewhat amorphous that 3CI provides, right? That the kind of label community innovation even is so broad. Um, but I think, and I'm happy to, to talk more about this, um, my particular area of interest um, was around how do you make capital and different forms of capital flow in ways that actually make communities better? And then that second question of how would you know that communities or the planet are better? Those were always two questions I was fascinated by, but I didn't really know how to engage with them um, in a professional sense. And then over time, as it turned out, in both a research and teaching sense. And um, as, as Heather, I think you've also pointed out, um, you know, having seen both Ted Jackson and, and Tessa Hebb, you know, in action, as it were, 
being both really good academics, but also committed to teaching and then being quite active in these roles around engaging with community organizations, convening, collaborating. Um, I think that in a sense, like, you know, just showed me that that's what I wanted to be, but I also probably didn't know anything different. So for me, that's what community innovation really is about is this combination of being able to um, thoughtfully try and understand, you know, what is the state of kind of issues in play in communities? How do you think at a systems level, um, but also then be quite practical around what are the types of solutions and what is the role of, of different groups um, and individuals within that? Because uh, any one of these big challenges, whether it's food or education or health, I mean, they all require multi, um, multimodal solutions and multi-actor kind of interventions. Um, I think the benefit uh, for those of you that are studying um, public policy, public domain, so I graduated in 2007 uh, with an MPA, um, and I started my initial interaction with 3CI in around 2005, um, 2006. Um, what that really allowed me to do was to realize a government can be really helpful, but it actually can be quite constraining to work in government if you really want to make a dent in community innovation. So I think that that's essentially one of the things that I took out of 3CI is actually that I care about some of the broad issues related to public good, but actually my starting point was, hey, I need to work in government to be able to make that difference. Coming out of that 3CI experience, um, I basically realized that I could work with government from the outside and have a lot more autonomy and independence. Um, and I think that has carried through, which would be kind of strange maybe coming from someone who actually chose to do a, a public policy degree and got in uh, you know, to one of the, the recruiting programs. I basically only lasted a couple of months before I went back to Ted and Tessa and said, hey, I'd rather do the work that, that I was doing with you than to be essentially constrained and siloed in the government uh, departments that I think I will be. So it's, um, that was interesting for me because I think at that time, which is again around 15 years ago, these fields for some of you that are aware of social enterprise, social finance, now what we might call impact investing, um, this intersection that um, capital can be directed in ways that, that make the world better rather than make the world worse, uh, which is you know, everything from climate change to homelessness, et cetera. There are unique and innovative tools and structures that we can build by bringing financial capital, social capital or intellectual capital in combinations to make the world better. That was what I, found out at 3CI. And, and since then, I've been able to actually, um, in a sense, like work in those areas in different ways. So I've started a couple of companies. I've worked for a couple of consulting firms. Um, you know, I've been able to work with Ted Jackson, for example, on a bunch of international kind of um, projects and evaluations with Tessa on um, co-chairing a task force for the government of Ontario around how to define um, standards around impact measurement, which, you know, interestingly now Kate Ruff is leading uh, the common approach. So when I'm, I'm only half joking when I said I didn't really leave 3CI because I think the good news about 3CI is that it is an interesting container um, and still continues to be for this nexus of how do you bring people together in ways that actually advance public good, but not be too dogmatic about the tools and the structures, but also not get caught up just in thinking like you're in government or thinking like an academic, but give you enough of the best of all of those worlds. So I think for me, that was really what I took out of it and I've tried to essentially build on over the last 15 years. Um, maybe I would just say one final thing before, before I wrap up. I think the connections, you know, as um, both uh, probably Omar, you know, you've alluded to and Heather, you said, um, I know some of the early events that 3CI held, um, I ended up getting one of my first jobs with a really interesting group called Social Capital Partners. I ended up collaborating with an academic I met 12, 13 years ago in one of Tessa's events. Um, so I would just say that if you are meeting people or you're not yet meeting people, get to engage with them because essentially five, 10 years down the road, you know, they're the people who might offer you jobs, collaborate with you, or essentially you might hire them. Um, which is, so it's kind of interesting to go full circle now, having the benefit of this much time be able to see those early seeds, which at that time were just fun and interesting, but kind of over time were actually quite transformative to be able to do the kind of work that I am doing right now. So happy to talk more about you know, the subject area, et cetera, um, during the q &A. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, Karim. Uh, you know, I really, uh, I thought it was so interesting. You, you, you went into an M a master's in public policy thinking that you'd want to work in government and uh, realized that uh, through some of your work at 3CI that, you know, it, it created this path of, of influencing government from the outside. And, and I've see, seen how you've done that by being really entrepreneurial, right? And really sort of bridge, bridge building and silo breaking in uh, the kind of work that you're, you're doing. Um, I, I have a bunch of questions for you guys, and I'm sure some of the uh, participants do as well, but I just want to bring uh, Kareem Abuawad in here, uh, you know, because I have a feeling that he's listening to these stories with, with a bit of a thought about like, what's, you know, what are, the, what are the parallels, what's happening here in terms of the transition between a student's experience and this career experience. So Kareem, if you want to share a bit, but Kareem is from uh, the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Affairs at Carleton. He's Dr. Kareem Abuad. Uh, so has also done the whole graduate school thing for many years himself. Uh, and now advises, you know, graduate students on the next steps in careers. So if you want to just tell us a bit about what you're hearing, Kareem, and, and uh, maybe let's let participants know how they can connect with you afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I mean, there is already a, a, a theme emerging here, right? So just listening to the, the three panelists, there's already a theme emerging. And, and this theme has to do with the structure of graduate school, right? So a, a graduate degree, and if you think about it, a graduate degree is a highly structured endeavor, right? Uh, and as a student, as a graduate student, it's easy to fall into that trap. Right, uh, you, you just you just have this ready-made structure. There are many many people who have thought this structure through and put it in place, and it's there for you to use. Right, uh, you have to go through it, uh, and that's great. I mean, that's that's uh, a mistake I made in in grad school. Right, so I uh, was within that structure basically one hundred percent of the time. Now. What does it mean to do grad, uh, to, to do professional development? It, it really means, in, in a nutshell, to try and break out of that structure as much as possible. I know it's tempting to just focus on the things that that are within that structure because, you know, uh, they're 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 immediate. These are things that uh, you have to do, right? They're they're like they're they're part of your immediate concern, right? Uh, but, you know, listening to the panelists, it seemed that just breaking out of that structure uh, means that you get to clarify your goals, maybe test them, maybe discover things that you didn't even know that you were interested in. Uh, it, it helps you define your trajectory, right? So, you know, like I thought I was interested in X, but it turns out, you know, doing professional development and engaging in this and doing that uh, made me realize that actually I'm interested in why. Right? And that's huge uh, because like that in itself can, can save somebody like half a decade, uh, you know, if not more. So yes, I mean, at Graduate Professional Development, we provide a lot of resources and these resources are there for uh, people who are interested in enhancing this skill or, you know, developing uh, this competency or learning how to write reports more effectively. We do all of that. Uh, but I think for me, a, a big part of doing professional development is really not, a, not, it's not about a specific set of skills, but really breaking out of that, uh, of that structure. And it's really important to uh, do that in a deliberate manner. Uh, not just, uh, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that. Uh, do it in a deliberate manner uh, whereby you're reflecting like, oh, you know, um, this is interesting. Uh, maybe I, I didn't know anything about community innovation before. And I thought it was this like fuzzy thing as, as one of the panelists mentioned. But actually, uh, there are many interesting careers, uh, potential careers in there. That's a much better and much better approach than um, uh, doing what's expected, 
Like, you know, you do political science, you go work for the government, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think if you want to do that, it, it, you should do it in a deliberate manner. Like, yes, I do want to work for the government because of X, Y, and Z, right? That's very different than, you know, doing it because it's part of the structure, right? And at the end of the day, uh, being a graduate student means uh, you're in a, a rich environment. The university is a very rich environment because it brings people together from all different places. Uh, so take advantage of that, right? Uh, if you're not getting out of that structure, you're not gonna experience any of that. So try to take advantage of, of the time that you spend in, in grad school because it is really uh, a rich environment. So thank you for, for the panelists. I think, I think like these, these types of stories uh, are really important uh, because they, they help other people um, kind of try new things uh, and, and try to put their goals to the test, so to speak. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kareem. If you could, uh, I know that you offer consultation and workshops through FGPA. So if you can maybe drop the, the contact point or the, the website into the chat. Uh, yeah. I also invite any participants, now is your chance to uh, raise any questions in the chats that we can then put to the panelists. In the meantime, I have two very different questions for the panelists. So the, the three of you can answer whichever one of these you like. You all talked about how important network building was for the steps you took. You know, you talked about it in terms of the, the work you did as research assistants with three CI projects, but also beyond that. Can you give us a practical example of how do you how do you start network building? What did that look like? Uh, that's one one question that I welcome you to think about. The other one is in a different direction, but it has to do with our title. We have a lot of people here who are interested in this idea of community innovation. Omar spoke a bit to what he thinks this means to him, but I, I invite others to say, what, what do you see as like, what's happening in this space? Um, and what types of opportunities do you think that this is presenting? You, you heard that we've got people here from across the university. And uh, just if you have some practical examples of kind of the entrepreneurial or the, the sort of, you know, the bridge building opportunities that you see emerging. So do any of you want to go first on any of those questions? Heather, go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to, to speak to especially the, the second question around some of those opportunities in, in community innovation. Um, from the, the academic perspective, I think, you know, Carleton 3CI is really a pioneer in, in this area, but I think that's, you know, we're starting to see, I think, a lot more universities um, really sort of grasp onto this, this idea that it's it's important and it's meaningful to to be able to to uh, encourage faculty to and students to engage with community um and and to really bring them in um into the university through teaching and research as well as sort of getting out of the, the university and and getting into community um and so i think some of the the examples i'm seeing where where there are sort of more grants that are starting to place emphasis on that type of, of community university partnerships um, and and I think just really great opportunities um, if for those of you who are, are sort of interested or think you may be interested in that sort of um, academic route that, that being an academic I think doesn't doesn't mean the same thing as maybe it did even 10 years ago, I think we're, we're starting to see a lot more sort of flexibility and, and appreciation for, for, yeah, sort of what would be used to be considered sort of a non-traditional academic role. Um, so I, I, I'm really encouraged by, by that. Um, I'm encouraged by, yeah, the, the, the opportunities, um, some of the, the teaching as well that I'm, I'm able to engage in um, at Royal Rose. We've got like a new uh, BBA program all sort of centered around project-based learning for students. So it's, it's a lot more exciting like bringing in community partners into the classroom and, and having students work with them on a, a project that has some sort of public benefit. So, so I think, yeah, for those of you interested in the, the academic space, I think it, all of this sort of um, this experience, this this you know, building your your networks with community, not just sort of academics, is, is really sort of vital to, to I think a uh, successful career. And I think just that motivation to get out of the out of bed every morning, that, I think that's really what 
what we're all sort of saying around, you know, how to just sort of find your way forward or where you want to go is, is what's going to get you up every morning and out of bed and, and wherever that is, if it's you know, academic track or, or government or, or otherwise. Um, yeah, I think there's I just see a lot of opportunity. Yeah. And, and you managed to address both of my questions because you talked about community innovation in a practical sense in terms of the for students picking up on projects that they can do with external partners as part of their coursework, which then also speaks to the speaks to the networking piece, right? Because then those are the contacts that might become the building blocks to uh, to career options. Um, I well, we've got a hand up. So before I go to you, uh, Karim or Omar, on my question, so uh, let's just bring Aya into the mix. Hey, yeah, uh, sorry. I'm uh, just really excited to ask so many questions. Uh, really interesting experiences here. Um, I was just wondering how has um, language, skills, roles, values in terms of uh, doing community innovation work changed, uh, let's say over the last like five or 10 years, um, especially in light of, I guess, like just uh, like tech that has gotten in and, uh, um, interest of like more an anthropometric sort of like view of things wanting to be like more human centered like and anything else that I, I don't know about. Mm, interesting question how has this field changed in the last five or ten years and you know and in the midst of that COVID right which uh, I think has changed a lot of how we work uh, I I wouldn't have been doing this round table from my home today and thus would not have been speaking to the breadth of people that I'm speaking to now. So things are changing fast. Uh, Karim, I see you nodding your head a bit. Do you want to jump in on any of these questions? Sure, let me try. It's a good question. Um, I think one reflection for me, kind of even early on in, in my journey, like post 3CI, this kind of nexus of, you know, what is now called impact investing used to be called social finance and social enterprise. Like those were fairly early kind of days of when there was, was fragmented activity across Canada, but not really a consolidated effort to try and build out fields or practice or get people together. So I think on one hand, I got fairly lucky coming into kind of an early stage of when some of the discussions were happening and then almost through my research, because a bunch of the research initially was actually looking at what's happening in the US and in the UK. Um, so drawing on the language and experiences outside of Canada, as things were beginning to happen in Canada, I could bring something to those discussions without having had 10 years of experience in it or, or whatever. So for me, one really interesting reflection, and again, almost like I valued it much more later, was in the early days of being part of this field, which I was really, or these fields I was really excited about, I could look outside of Canada, look at the report, spend the time to read, summarize, write. I ended up doing a lot of blogging when blogging was a thing, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, and even early days of Twitter. So I was, <laughs> remember tweeting at a conference, there were like two of us back of one of these um, big social innovation conferences. And, and I think we were the only two people that had probably heard about Twitter in that room or whatever. So it was interesting because at that time, the ability to capture and synthesize and translate knowledge from outside of Canada to a Canadian audience provided a comparative advantage in lieu of the experience of having like 10 or 15 years of practical kind of experience. So for me, that was quite empowering because it was not a barrier and in fact was an opportunity. So I'd almost say when you identify those kind of pockets in the fields and areas you're working in or excited about, which often aren't just like one field, it's usually at the intersection of multiple fields. And so that's really, I think, gets at the heart of what community innovation, social innovation is all about, is that you've got these intersections um, of like food and healthcare, or, you know, kind of microfinance and community development. At some of those intersections, those are really unexplored areas. And the more you have the ability to actually interface between them, um, you have a comparative advantage within that kind of intersection, even if you don't have 10 or 15 years experience. So I, I guess for me, that was really helpful because over time, then I got to be able to actually contribute to what I wanted the field to become, um, you know, over the next decade or two. Um, and I think for some of us that are early career, you, you just don't feel like you have enough to contribute. However, you can always get started. And you can always then develop your own voice through either kind of 
writing, engaging, um, using social media creatively. So I think, again, if you're good at a certain skill set, so for example, I was doing a lot of technical work around evaluation and program evaluation, I could then translate some of those concepts to a more, to a finance audience in their language, um, whereas because the evaluation language just didn't work for them. So I would say that sometimes, you know, you just got to be uh, conversant across multiple domains and then be able to essentially do that for long enough in, you know, before a thing becomes mainstream or, or kind of hot, um, because the early days are really where the fun part is. Anyway, maybe I'll stop there because hopefully that gives you some inspiration on, on things you're thinking about. Yeah, thank you, Karim. I, one thing that I just want to reinforce about what you just said, early in my career, I noticed that there had been a, a, a very high level critique of a government policy made a few years ago and the government brought out a bunch of recommendations and said we'll follow we'll do all that and nobody had tracked it nobody had figured out like did they did the government do what they said they were going to do and i was on various conference calls with civil society activists and i was raising this and they all said yeah that's something somebody's got to do that somebody's got to do that and i was a student and i thought well i got a bit of time i can do that um, and then I actually got started doing it. And then some organizations said, well, we can help fund that. And that was an interesting conversation. And it eventually it turned into a publication in my name that helped my academic career. Like, and it, but it could have equally helped my career moving into civil society uh, in a different way. And it was just, you know, you all see things that are needed in the fields that you're studying because you're spending so much time looking with your microscopes and seeing where those crossovers are, as Karim was just saying. And in some cases, it's just a matter of saying, I'm going to be the person who steps up to do that thing, even if no one's going to pay me yet, because one day somebody will pay to do that work, right? That gets complicated because you have to have something else that's paying the bills and so on and so forth. I'm not saying this is all easy, but, but that those can be the steps that take you forward. Omar, uh, we are getting close to time, but I, have you got any uh, reflections on any of the questions that you've been hearing? And... Yeah, perhaps I can talk about uh, net networking and what that means for me. I always found, found it really daunting. And um, hmm. it's something that everyone tells you you need to do, which creates this uh, really, um, it creates a lot of pressure on, oh, what's the right way to do it? Um, who, do I, who do I need to talk to? And uh, I made a lot of mistakes uh, early on in my career, and I still do with networking. But I, I think what I've what I've started how, doing. How so, Omar, what, what do you mean by mistakes? So I think I think one thing is um, I think you can you don't need to aim if you go to a conference and you see the keynote speaker, and you're like, I'm going to talk to that keynote speaker because they're the highest on the food chain. <laughs> I, I I think that was that was something that I used to think I wouldn't do it because I would get like just they wouldn't have time or whatever but i think just talk to whoever um you find interesting and uh it wants to talk to you as well um and talk to them as as people not as a as a means to an end um because you never know um eventually what that might lead to and the second m sort of mistake or thing that i haven't I stopped doing and i probably used to because i was always really afraid of being unemployed is thinking that look talking to a person and just thinking are you going to give me a job afterwards uh how is this going to translate into potential employment for me um usually that's not how it works at least for me um i know karim said that, that happened with him one time but i i haven't had that experience where we would chat at a conference and then next day you're hired um but i have a lot of great people that i can talk to and for example for my work we organize webinars as well and i remember oh that person used to work on that thing let's we can work together see where that goes and things just go in unexpected ways so i guess just relieve the pressure off of yourself and the other person you're talking to and just just try to have a nice conversation uh doesn't have to have a doesn't have to have an end goal uh always yeah that's really uh, helpful advice omar so we're we're really down to, well in fact it is two o'clock officially i'm just going to see if we can just go over a couple of minutes because i just want to ask each of our panelists to share any final words. And in that, there's one more question that's come up here, uh, which uh, Ida said, what's the biggest difficulty you faced while collaborating? So if anybody wants to end on a, a story of how they dealt with a, a challenge in collaboration, that'd be great. And then we'll wrap up. 
Heather, sure. you want to go first? Yeah, I'm happy to, to share my, I guess, challenge. It, it, like, yeah, I guess I, I don't want to sort of underestimate the, the challenge of doing this type of work. And I think just going back to my earlier comments around, like, look to, to those who are sort of leading and have led their way through um, through all those different pressures and, and tensions that you'll face. And, and I mean, my experience is on the academic side, but I, I like there's challenges as well in, in different sectors. Um, and, and I think so for, for my experience, it's it's like you really have to take the time to understand like what the, the partner or the collaborator, mm -hmm. um, what their limitations are, what their objectives are, sort of what perspective they're coming to something from. And, and if you're just sort of going out and assuming that sort of everybody is starting on that sort of same, um, same place that you're starting from um, and has the same motivations, I think you, you, you'll certainly run into to challenges. And, and so just, I think that's why going back to my, my advice, like in, in terms of like, if it takes you a while to sort of find where you really fit, that's, that's, that's good. That's, that's a good experience. Draw on those, those experiences, having worked like, like her and my, I also had a brief stint in the, the public sector working for the federal government and, and, um, and so like draw from those, those experiences and that knowledge, because I think that will, will really help in terms of overcoming some of the, the collaboration challenges um, in doing some of this, this work, because it, it is really challenging and it does take that, like that empathy, that ability to understand sort of where all the different partners are, are coming from and sort of what they need and you know, what those limitations are. Yeah, those are great, uh, great final thoughts from you, Heather, on, uh, on really understanding the, your partners, collaborators, the people you're working with, trying to understand where they're coming from and bring that into how you're engaging with them. Karim, any final words? Yeah, you know, just maybe building on what Heather said, you know, it's been my experience anyway, having done um, a lot of different things over the last um, 15 years or so in a variety of different uh, roles some of which I initiated, some of which I joined, and others um, were, were really, you know, kind of partner-led. Just be conscious of what you're trying to essentially aim for or optimize for. You know, in some projects, for example, you're, you're really learning, um, and that's, that's all you're doing. In others, you have a comparative advantage around contributing some knowledge or skill, and you can be um, really good at that. In others, maybe it's a bit of a blend. You know, in some cases, you need uh, stability at various points in your life. Uh, maybe the government job is the one you should take. In other cases, the you know you can be entrepreneurial. Um, and so I would just say that at each phase of how you make choices around how do my skills or education translate, just think about what you're trying to optimize for, both in terms of what you want to get as well as what you can give. Um, and I think that you know consider that to be a fluid kind of balance, as, as Heather said. I think that's certainly been my experience, and I found that. While it's not always the easiest way to, to build a career necessarily, and, and there's obviously lots of risks, it's much more fulfilling. And I feel like I've done some good things with the kind of autonomy um, or way of thinking um, in that way. Again, it's not for everyone, but I almost think the world today and particularly the post-COVID era is going to give us more of these kinds of opportunities. You want to do your own thing, you can. You know, If you want to work virtually somewhere else, you can. If you want to work in government, you can do that too. Um, so I think take advantage of that flexibility because there's probably never been a better time to take advantage of it, um, but also to use that to figure out what you want to learn and how you can contribute kind of in increasingly more substantial ways over time. Thanks, Karim. So uh, <clears throat> some reflection, know yourself uh, at, at, and know that, that who yourself is and what you, you have to offer changes over time. Uh, and it, just one more plug for FGPA because I know a lot of the the exercises and workshops that uh, Kareem Abuawad and his colleagues do uh, really help students to, to do that work because it doesn't always happen just in the conversations between you and your supervisor and your, uh, your colleagues. Omar, any final uh, words from you? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think everyone had really amazing contributions um, and I don't know how to add to that, but maybe one thing that I can say is that um, uh, at, at Food Secure Canada, at least, we're, we're a sort of a national organization and a little bit more removed from the, the innovations uh, on the ground, or we try to collect all of them together. So what I try to do to um, sort of keep myself grounded in that work is just, I think, and for everyone that they can or should do, is just try to see what is happening in your immediate local, like, physical community. There's always a need for something. There's always potential to do um something bigger and better and or like 
something to fight against or for. So um, this is obviously very general, but I think that that always helps bring things to the table in your professional career. And um, they show up unsuspected, like in surprising ways sometimes, and you become much more well-rounded person and um, professional uh, once you, once you do that. Hey, thank you, Armour. That's a, those are really great words to go off. Uh, so look around your own community and get involved. And I like the way you said, there's always something to fight for, fight for or fight against. Uh, yeah. And, and there's all kinds of growth that can happen and networks that can be built through that. And then they lead to other things. Thank you all, uh, all three of you, uh, Karim, Omar, and Heather for being our panelists today. Thank you for Karim from FGPA for also coming. Thank you so much to Jen Harrison for setting this all up. Um, I, before we close off, Jen, are you able to put the, uh, the evaluation sheet or I will do it right now. And I also just wanna say, so before people leave, um, the, uh, you can open up this link on your computers that I just sent into the chat. And then please give us your feedback on this session and maybe any other sessions that you'd like to see us do, uh, probably at this point, starting in the fall. Uh, and I just want to say mea culpa. I, I generally try and keep the webinars within the hour and I went over now by seven minutes. So I, this is like a big webinar faux pas. Thank you for sticking with us, all of you. Uh, really appreciate that you've all been here today and I uh, look forward to seeing you at future roundtables in person or virtual that 3CI will offer. Thanks everybody. Thank you.